Mrs. Lennon. Oh, Mrs. Lennon. Checking the sky to see if there's no cloud. There's no cloud. Oh, then I guess it must be all right. Should we let it play? Well, we'll are we supposed to talk? I think that's a good idea. <laughs> Hi, Michael, this is Yoko Ono. <laughs> Yoko, what? What is this we've just been watching a little bit of for fun? Well, it's a, a, a called Free Time, and uh, in New York, uh, like 40 years ago or something. It's 1972, like that. it aired. 1972. Yeah. That's 42 years. What? It's, I think it's about, it's, yeah, yeah. 40 years ago, yeah. And um, yeah, on a TV, uh, there was a program called Free Time, and we yeah. did this. And this is you and John. Yeah, me and John Jonas Mikas. And Jonas Mikas. Yeah. I had two very good assistants. <laughs> <laughs> you, you did. Um, and this has, I think, not been seen very much before, yeah? Or maybe no, I don't think so. Yeah. Well, I was so happy that you decided to share it with us now so we could see it. It's a blanket, a little well, cold. Well, occasionally, <laughs> we like to hide. <laughs> I wasn't quite sure about my thing, but I... I so oh, you, you dispensed I it. it. I dispensed it. I feel very okay now. You feel good. Thank all you. right about it. Yeah. Oh, good. I, I also didn't want anybody to think that I was popping out of that bag. That was John, so that was a different thing. <laughs> I don't think that should have been a concern, but it's no. all right. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, let's, let's start uh, at the... Um, First of all, let's, let's talk for a moment about the, the book that's come out lately, because this is a very curious thing. Uh, the Which one? Which the one? Flower. Oh. Yeah. So the, tell me a little bit how, how this book uh, came invisible about. Flower, the Invisible Flower. The Invisible Flower. Well, it was very interesting, because I just forgot about it. And uh, it was in a pile of things, an old pile. And Sean, my son, discovered it. He said, Mommy, this has to come out. I said, no, I mean, what are you talking about? That was like when I was 19 or 18 or something. You don't want to put that out. I said, no, we have to put it out because this John is my dad. I said, well, but I didn't know any John then. I know, that's why it's interesting. <laughs> so the point is that there's this invisible flower, just for people who don't know the book already, of course. And it, and it, it, 
it's a flower. It's you, there's a series of drawings you did and and yeah. Well, phrases. in those days too, yeah. I was interested in doing something that is totally different. You know, yeah. so instead of writing uh, this is an invisible flower, or something this is an invisible flower. Right. Sort of like letting it dance. Right. And I thought it was very interesting to do that. But um, I thought, why bring that out? And there's so many things I want to bring out now. <laughs> this is crazy. No, but it's, it's very beautiful. And it's about there being this flower in, in the countryside, which is invisible, but you can smell its smell. And the only person who can smell it is somebody John. named Smelt is John. Yeah. Smelty John. And I thought, yeah. why did I use the name Smelty John? I don't know. But what happened was that uh, it was in 1952, and John, who was a lad in Liverpool. Uh, in 1952, uh, February 18th, which is my birthday, mm. he did a drawing mm. of him and another person who looked very much like me, and sort of like- On horseback. <laughs> on horseback, I yeah. know. So we were both thinking about each other in 1952, which is, I mean, <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, one of the things that struck me as interesting about the book was that it went back to this time when you were a child and went sent into the countryside after the the bombing started in Tokyo. I know. Yeah. So tell me a little. Let's go back for a moment. In oh, fact, okay, okay. in fact, we have another really <laughs> wonderful <laughs> film. I think we can start to show. A which little would bit, be great. maybe. Oh yeah. Let's uh, do Carla, it. do you think you can put that in my put childhood the, film? Yeah. So these are home movies. Yes. Uh, in the thirties, and my father and my mother loved to just take photos and and uh, films of everything. And they did them themselves, you know. Yeah. So, and this is your father we're looking at yes, at the moment. Yes, that's my father. <laughs> yeah. Handsome man and tall, yeah? He was over six foot, six yeah. feet tall, yeah. yeah. What did he think of John? Uh, <laughs> I don't think I should. Well, maybe I should too. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, my family was, and I don't think that was a very good idea or anything like that, but um, always felt that people should look very beautiful. And so uh, when I uh, took John to my parents' place, my father just took me aside and said, the other one was more handsome. <laughs> <laughs> I, said, I mean, you know, it, it, it really is something that I cannot explain to you, but um, he, he's a very nice guy. He was a father, and a keen golfer we see here. It's a nice swing. But let's talk a little bit about your background. I find it extremely interesting, and it relates to your, to your work. I have a resistance about it. Oh. Well, maybe I should take this off. You have a resistance to talking about your job. Well, let about me see if I can overcome that resistance. OK. So you come from an extremely high, very uh, fancy OK, <laughs> that's <family>. enough. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and we've talked about this before, I mean, uh, a few times. So. Um, I mean, the, the nature of the, the world in which you grow up in is in many ways, it's gone, it's but it's incredibly funny. something that I don't think that uh, many people would understand it. And so th that's one of the reasons I didn't want to talk about it. But <sighs> it's like, um, well, uh, I was evacuated in the country mm -hmm. because my mother did not feel that we should join the stiff crowd of people uh, the, uh, that we know. Uh, in a sort of summer house district. So sh she sent me to a, a farm, actually. And uh, he, you know, she, her idea of farmers was like Symphony Pastoral by uh, Andre Gid, and she said, oh, farmers are beautiful people. So, <laughs> well, what's that? Oops, I guess, <gasps> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, my heart, is go go my heart was resisting that <laughs> statement. <laughs> anyway, so, but the farmers were not that uh, angelic people. They were not angelic people. No, yeah. and uh, many of the city people yeah. did actually die from not eating very much of them. Yeah. I was lucky I, I didn't die. <laughs> right. But, um, and but, so, but your friends, some of your friends at, uh, from school, the people you knew, I mean, oh, I know. They, they did very well. I mean, they were, they I were know, fine. Very straight. Well, I don't know if, if they thought they did they very did well. well. But I mean, in many cases, they but, didn't suffer. But uh, I was evacuated the farm, and my classmates were evacuated to one of the castles. So that, um, uh, you know, they, they had a very different idea about um, the war. And they were talking about, you know, in the castle, the, the food was not very good. And I was saying, 
oh my God, <laughs> what a different life. And I felt very outside about it because, well, we were, I mean, I was uh, part of that, um, that group of people, but I had a totally different experience by going to the farm. So, and then I forgot about how to talk, you know, in the way that the uh, kind of a court um, language. So, court language in yeah, Japanese, yeah. 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 So, when I came back, and one of my friends said, uh, How is this people? How is this people? I said, which, which people? I said, and she was very silent and she didn't know what I was, why I was objecting. And she finally found that in, in, in herself and said, uh, I'm asking how you are. Right. Because you are not supposed to use the word you because it's very. Um, too too, too uh, direct. Yeah, to address, you're supposed to not say you, but to say a, a person or a person or a people. Something less direct. This yeah, you, to you, make you've it told me once that when the queen came to your class at school, you, you talk <laughs> yeah. to, you and can't so, talk to her directly. Well, you know, because um, our school had all these, um, uh, well, uh, the, the royal family all went to this school. So uh, the queen, when she came to a classroom. It was very interesting because she was with, uh, standing there with an attaché and uh, we're not supposed to address the queen. And it's a very small room so she heard everything we said. <laughs> but, uh, may I address uh, the queen's attaché please? And then uh, we'd, we'd like to congratulate the queen for being in such a beautiful, healthy <laughs> position or something like that. And the queen knows, you know, but... She was right there, but you couldn't even talk to her. I know. I mean, I bring all this up because, you know, I mean, so much of your work and the, the importance of it and, uh, and the work of other people, other artists after the war, yeah. um, had to do with kind of upsetting comp the, the whole social order in a way. It was... The social order was totally confusing and chaotic yeah. at the time. Yeah. It was, but I mean, it seemed like you were pushing against... Uh, you were pushing against your own background, the, the sort of... A very complicated situation. Yeah. So, I mean, what, what, how much of that was a personal feeling of pushing against your... You loved your parents and, uh, and uh, you know, you, you admired your parents, but how much of this was the desire to reject uh, the, your, your own personal past and to create something else? Well, I don't know. I mean, it's like when you're drowning in the water, you know, you want to just come out, but you don't know how you're coming out. I mm. mean, you're just coming out, you know. Mm. So, and why were you drowning? I mean, in what sense? What was, what was so suffocating? I'm drowning in this very kind of like, uh, as strict is not the word for it, but uh, a kind of society mm. that was uh, reigning over other societies. And it was very dangerous in a way because um, there was a socialist, and my great-grandfather was assassinated by one of the socialist journalists. Yeah, he was a banker. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, you also told me an interesting story once about uh, being very lonely. This related to your work. I thought it was a very unusual situation. I <laughs> Totally unusual, but I didn't think it was unusual. <laughs> At the time. Yeah. So in order to keep you company, you had to, well, you tell the story. It's your life. Well, you know, um, my mother felt that um, uh, I would, well, the family would be taken advantage of if I just had um, friends, just any friends. So that she designated um, this girl who was two years older than me and uh, who was, uh, uh, had a, uh, a little house be behind my house and uh, sort of a, a superintendent. And she was a very good friend of mine, but from her side, I don't think she was that interested in playing with me because she was two years older than me. And so she said, well, one day she said, um, my mother needs me, I have to go now. I have to go home. So I said, sure. But I just had a feeling that it wasn't that. So I just ran and went very quietly to look into their window, which was very low. And, you know, and I saw that she was playing with another, well, her, her playmate. And I felt very, very hurt about that. But so the thing is, it was a, 
a pretty lonely life in a sense that I was counting on her to be my friend. So um, in a situation like that, and with the, the fact that my family felt that they were socially responsible to take care of people and the society and all that. Uh, so it was, kind of, well, it was kind of natural for me to uh, mm. do something like, uh, what is it? Uh, um, going into a situation where we, I, I would promote audience participation. Mm. Yeah, I mean, the way you put it to me was that, the, uh, that your response to the, the, that feeling of loneliness and the feeling of not being included that she was excluding was also something... I was not included you, anyway. <laughs> you, felt, you felt this desire to have a kind of inclusive sort of work so that you, your art would not be something that, was, that you did in a way alone, yeah. but that would be, invite people to participate. Well, I didn't start to invite people to participate until the, much later. You know? Of course. But when I decided that, I really felt that kind of resistance yeah. that most artists will feel. Right. By the way, they're laughing because they see you won first prize in a fancy dress ball. <laughs> <laughs> and I like the, I liked the, the scene where you were in the bath and playing the piano. It's very nice. You were in San Francisco before the Golden Gate Bridge was finished. I know. I think there's a there's little a, clip of it. Uh, a point in that film yeah. where you see that the bridge, the Golden Gate Bridge is like this. And, and it's not finished yet. It was just my father just took it. You know. And there you were dancing. Did you, I mean, did you, you have good memories of America when you were coming to visit your father this early on? Did, can you still have memories of I this have time? memories all the way huh. and it's amazing because you know my father came up on the ship yeah and uh, I, and i saw this beautiful beautiful almost like a golden uh air of mm. san francisco behind him mm. and he was standing and then he kissed my mother and i was looking like this <laughs> even I, I even remember that you know and so he looked at me and so maybe he felt guilty or something he was just you know, gave me a little kiss as well. <laughs> <laughs> but there was something else you once told me, Spi. I was just thinking now, I was asking you how your father reacted to John. You once said to me that John didn't really understand your family background either. You said that you, he expected to meet these two little Japanese people. Well, you see, the thing is because I was not going to talk about my background because it was sort of like, uh, well, I wouldn't say monstrous, but that's the word that <laughs> just came to me. Monstrous in a way that it's so different, even in Japan. And uh, I just didn't want to go into that. But John, was, uh, John had a lot of things to tell me about his background. <laughs> so it was very good to sort of talk about his background. It was very interesting for me, very interesting. Yeah. And then he, saw, he met your father, you said, who was very tall, didn't look like it, he was very dapper. Yeah, he was a dapper, and my mother was very beautiful. Mm, yeah, that's true. And she was a painter, he was a pianist. So you yes. came from an artistic background, although he was a banker, yeah. I guess, by profession. So he was totally disappointed when he had mm. to, well, not inherit, but to become a banker. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's very, it's, as I said, to me, it's very interesting because in a way you fulfilled some of the dreams that they had, although you were doing it in a way that they would never have seen. I didn't seen. think that I fulfilled their dreams. I really felt that I disappointed them. Mm. And that was sort of like um, partly feeling guilty about it, but not really, because I had to survive in the way that I could survive. Yeah. So when you, when you started to go out on your own, what was the Japanese art scene like in the very beginning when you were very young and sort of finding your way? What, what, was, what well, was it like? You see, these are things that might interest you because probably you don't know, but Japan is very near Russia. And so all the sort of um, uh, Malovich and all those people who are doing ex in extremely avant-garde things in Russia, um, we were part of it in a way. I mean, we knew about it. You know? And my father uh, is the first person who translated about Malovich and uh, what he was doing and all that. Uh, which was in French, and then my uncle, who married a, a Russian woman, violinist, violinist, had to help him to sort of cover the Russian part or something. But that's how, the, uh, what is it, Movo. Mm. Movo was the um, Preceded Gutai. movement, yeah. art movement, before Gutai. Mm. 
So, I mean, it's interesting that your father was in some ways part of the instruction in Japan in, in Russian avant-garde. I know, yeah. it's very interesting, yeah. yeah. So for you, but I'm saying, well, what was the scene like after the war, or now some years after the war, but um, in Japan as you were trying to, what kind of artists did you meet, what kind of? Well, I didn't meet, well, I didn't meet very many artists. Yeah, you didn't? No. Yeah. In fact, um, I was more kind of by myself in terms of uh, starting to think of all different ideas, that creative ideas. Yeah. So it was really in America that you, of course, came and then you felt really that you were establishing an identity I as an artist. Very, yeah, I felt yeah. very uh, strongly identifying with the, the New York scene. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. And what was the New York scene like in the... <laughs> Well, you fell in very with all these amazing people. Yeah, I know, and yeah. it's just by chance, and it was very interesting. Um, Joan Cage was the biggest thing, of course, at, at the time in New York, and uh, we called him JC for Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> A modest. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but I mean that—that's how he meant to us in a way, and. Uh, mm. You know, there was a, an avant-garde situation there. Lamont Young and uh, and and you um, and you you had a loft downtown where where people came. It was a kind of yeah. open space. This must have been, I mean, of course, New York in those days was incredibly different too. So it was a much more informal scene, I guess. Yeah, I mean, people just well, came I don't know if it's informal or maybe it's informal now too. I don't know, but yeah. um, that's what I thought that I should do, and I did it, and. Um, I think that was the start of loft concerts. Yeah, yeah of loft concerts, it's yes, true. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it, there are a couple of things that you seem very uh, crucial to. One is actually that whole loft scene, it's true, absolutely right. And, and the other is this idea of, of audience uh, participation, of having people actually participate. Because you were pointing out the performance art, which of course was evolving over the 20th century, but yeah. especially later in the 50s, 60s, 70s. The performance art often involved people doing a thing, but it wasn't always so much about getting the audience, uh, getting other people no, to complete and, and do very, your work. I even had some resistance about it. I mean, oh. artists usually want to uh, keep um, one's um, uh, creativity yeah. without people touching it, you know, and hopefully that would go on forever or something yeah. like that. And I had that in me too. And when I thought of uh, involving people to my work, I felt a strong resistance, and I thought, well, this is good because I feel such a strong yeah. resistance. You, know? you mean the fact that there was resistance, you thought that was something yeah, that should that make you do it? It's a new way of doing things. <laughs> right, exactly. If it was too easy, maybe it wouldn't be as interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, you also, I wonder to, to what extent you, you also had certain themes that you were consciously pursuing. When I look at some of the early work you were doing, there, there's, there's certain characteristics to it that cross over from one work to another. Some, some it's very gentle and so slightly funny. Um, it's not always direct, it's sort of, sort of poetic, indirect. Um, some of it is actually the reverse in a way. It's, I mean, I'm, the, over a period of time, I'm talking about different things, but confrontational or, and well, about. Well, you know, the sense of humor thing that you picked out. Mm. Um, I was thinking about it uh, yesterday after we spoke, and yeah. I thought, Probably it has a lot to do with the kind of envir environment I was mm. brought up in. Mm. I mean, they like sort of deadpan, you know, kind of humor mm. rather yeah. than ha ha, you know. Right. So there was that. I think yeah. it wasn't sort of unique or anything like that. But I, I had that, yeah. But did you see that as part of a um, a language you wanted to develop, or was it just it just was what came naturally? <sighs> it just came naturally. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, I was going to say the other, the flip side of this is that there there always seemed to be. Um, in your work, an exploration of um, really quite serious issues about um, how people treated women, about uh, uh, violence, whether it was physical or psychological. Um, maybe we can play a little bit of cut piece, which is, I think is oh, a really kind of well, interesting. I, I'm sure that you've seen it before, but maybe we should see yeah. it again. <laughs> and maybe you can talk to us a little about cut piece. It seems emblematic. Yeah. Kara, cut piece. Here it is. <laughs> this, by the way, was the first time, and the Maisels filmed it, but this is the first time it was done Albert in... Albert and David Maisels. In New just York. Just came yeah. and said, 
I would like to, we would like to film this, what, what you're going to do. You can uh, uh, have people said, look at the film for a moment. Well, yeah. okay, you know. <laughs> I didn't resist it. But now when I think about it, it was fantastic that, you know, I didn't resist it. Yeah. Could you turn down the lights here just for a moment? What, what, what? No, I just want people to be able to see the film. I guess oh, they yeah, can't yeah. see it. I can't see it. <laughs> You were 32. Was I? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> had you done this before, this performance yeah, in 65? I did it in Japan. But uh, I was really into this kind of a, a pure puritanic or purist uh, kind of feeling. And so I thought that if I'm going to do this, yeah. I should use the, the best jacket or best uh, outfit that I have. Really? So that was, this was the best outfit? You know, to, yeah, so that, one was night my, performance. that was the best outfit yeah. I had at the time. <laughs> <laughs> and also, in a way, I was not really scared because I was, you know, my mind was around here, right. not here. Well, well look, uh, you know, an, an ignorant outsider like me is going to say it's very hard not to see this in relation to some very ritualized, ceremonial Japanese kind of thing. I mean, really? seppuku uh, or something. Yeah, in what crazy. sense? I don't know. I well, didn't think you're that having was some, a ritual you're having like some, that in okay. Japan. <laughs> but you're having some sort of violence done to you. It's a kind of um, well, ritualized violence. Well, violence done to you yeah. is not necessarily unique to Japanese, you know. No, it's true. <laughs> but you're sitting there very <laughs> impassively. Maybe, maybe, maybe it has nothing to do with it. Oh, okay. So, so where did this come the from? The other side of it is yeah. the fact that you don't resist. It's, mm. you know, like in a way, you allow life to take over you. Yeah. So what was the impulse? T tell us a little bit about where this idea came from. Why? I thought it was very interesting to do it. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> when, I, when I thought about it, I thought, oh, this is a great one to do it. And I did it in Kyoto first. Yeah. And how was it received in Kyoto? How did people interpret it? Well, it was very quiet, and very few people came yeah. up on stage. Yeah. And then after New York, yeah. I did in London. Right. And when I said, okay, here's the you know, pair of scissors, the minute I said that, there was like 10 or 20 guys all came <laughs> up and said, <laughs> and I was immediately naked. I was, okay. oh my God. <laughs> and that was London in those days. Yeah. So, okay, so how much of it has to do with some, I mean, how much of it, when there was a kind of sexual thing? It's because, look, I mean, you know, oh, okay, the, the, okay. a lot of your no, work I'm is, not, yeah. I'm not saying that I'm not sexual. <laughs> right. But this thing, I didn't think of it as sexual. I thought of it in terms of, um, well, you know, uh, the, the thing that motivated me was about the Buddha's life. That Buddha, uh, who was the prince of uh, the castle, so, and he just forsaken all that and mm -hmm. just walked out. Mm. And then he walked up with, well, this is just a myth, a mythology, you know. That, uh, he walked up with um, his wife and children, and, and some people said, I would like your wife. Okay, well, take it. I would like your children. Take it. I mean, he just let everything go. Yeah. And then went into the mountain and you know, meditated or something. I don't think it's a moral story or anything like yeah. that. But um, I thought that's total giving, mm. total. Uh, Re, you know, re, resigning it was very interesting. I, I mean, do you think that's a, that's central to an artistic act? Do you think that's what artists need to do as well? I don't know. In my mind, there's no difference between uh, philosophical resolution and an artistic resolution. What do you mean by that? Well, I mean, the point is, you are totally resigned, which is a very interesting uh, philosophical. Um, a question of how you would um, go through life. Yeah. I mean, you, the, there, 
there seemed also at this moment, though, in the 60s, you know, this was a dawning moment of women's rights. And it's now interpreted as, and it's hard not to see this, as a very bold, uh, you know, kind of feminist act declaration about violence against women and your, your, your impassivity has a very particular kind of power to it. The fact that I, <coughs> I decided that people can take wherever he, they want to take, mm -hmm. not wherever I want to give, yeah. which was a very well, important thing. Because that is how, um, what, that is my experience as a woman in life. The people will take what they want, but that isn't necessarily what you will give. Exactly. Yeah. And I thought that was, um, because I was a woman, so I didn't think of it like um, a feminist act. I thought that was mm. the real act. That was how life was for me. Huh, yeah. When you, when you did pieces that were, uh, you just burn this painting or step in this painting, do, do these little lighter mats, do these, uh, how much was the thinking similar I in terms of? Yes, you know, lighter match this. Yeah. That, that, that was the, the uh, duration of the fire was almost, to me, it was uh, well, significant of life. Mm. And life was very short. Brief. Yeah, hmm. right. But, <laughs> okay. Wow. Really well, bright. thank you. <laughs> yeah. Life is short. You're turning 80 soon. What? You're turning 80 soon. Well, I know. <laughs> That's right. Thank you. See, it's very difficult for me to realize that I'm going to be 80. <laughs> I just don't feel like it. Yeah, what do you feel like? Well, I just feel like I want to dance. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. exactly. You, said to me, you said to me a very interesting thing, which I thought was related to, that's why I brought it up now. You said there are some people who, don't, who are not happy if you if you move your body and That's if you... That's true. You know, I'm just wearing these uh, jackets, which is made now, which is usually, the wa waist is very s narrow, and this part is not very narrow. I mean, that, that's how the, uh, you know, on the rack, you know, they, they have uh, jackets, and all of them are like made, cut, cut to that kind of uh, cut. So am I going to try to find something that is you know, like a nighty or something. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I just want to wear something that's here now. But when I do, um, I do get criticized by many people. And the minute I'm criticized, I feel like, okay, I'm going to stick to it. <laughs> <laughs> is, which is great, absolutely, yeah. It's very, I think that's very interesting. People want you to address your age, whatever that's supposed to mean. It's I terrible. I think that's an age. I, yeah. I had uh, racism, yeah. I had uh, sexism, yeah. uh, what else? Uh, but now it's ageism. Ageism, it's okay. It's yeah. amazing. We can make up some <laughs> Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, but you said something very interesting now, which is uh, that, you know, you, um, if they do this, you're, it's all the more, if they, people say these things, they're all the more, uh, strengthens your spine, makes you more resistant Oh, yes, to I'm this. like that. Yeah. I mean, if I'm not like that, I would have died 50 years ago, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Well, this is also something that maybe you, you, you've said that comes out of your background, this feeling of being sure of yourself and being able to resist uh, criticism or hostility. Well, you hostility. know, I, I resisted my whole background, mm -hmm. so why not? I could resist anything. Yeah. I mean, I have to say, did, the, when there was hostility about the Beatles and all this sort of <laughs> thing, this was, you, were, you felt fortified a bit. Well, because. I would say that um, being <laughs> criticized or in a way, it, it, some people do criticize and some people sort of like uh, liked it or something. But to be uh, born in this kind of situation um, was probably uh, just as intense and not very mm. pleasant. And I went through the same thing in the Beatles situation. Mm. You know? That's interesting. The, uh, it, it seemed to me that um, John was, must have been getting something from, from you too, of course. You, you brought a lot Thank to you. the table for him. <laughs> but because he was very interested in the work that you were doing, and, um, and you were a very established figure that, by that point in, 
in this circle. In the New York circle, yeah. Yeah, in the New York circle, yeah. which was interesting to him. He met <laughs> at, at a gallery. I mean, in what sense, what, what was the early part of your relationship based on, um, on well, your work? Well, it was more, I think John was very interested in my work. Yeah. Why, and why was he? As part of the avant-garde work, probably. And yeah. he was in, interested in that. Um, and, uh, and what else? I think probably he, he was a very instinctive person. Yeah. So I didn't have to tell him, but I, I think he sort of you know, guessed that I was coming from a very Different strange place. background. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but there must have been something that he felt was lacking in his creative life that was going to be... Well, yes, because, you know, it, it, uh, the kind of music they were creating is beautiful, but it was contextualized in a sense that it's, uh, you know, it's a, a kind of form that's mm. there. It's not breaking the form, but it's, it was a form that they used that was very, um, very effective. Yeah. So you think in a certain sense he saw you as somebody who was breaking forms, yeah, or at yeah, least working in a more... That, you know, I had the sort of, uh, what is it, the courage to just do it. Yeah. And he wanted oh. to do it. Yeah. He always said, I wanted to do it, you know. And he always felt that uh, if he had been uh, born in New York City or something, yeah. <laughs> he would have been in a total, total different situation. And he was always wanting that in a way. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, people often say that, that, you, that you, of course, in your marriage to John, you gained this enormous celebrity. But you also lost something, I would imagine, that must have been very conscious to you, and that is this sense of your own place as a figure in, your, in the, this world, your well, world. Well, I don't really know. I mean, up to then, I was uh, part of my parents' history. history. Huh. It was not my history. No. And um, I was about to be creating my own. Yeah. So, and it's the same thing. The, Beatles were not my history, it was John's history. Yeah. And I was still trying to create my own. Yeah. Well, I noticed that some of the works you did before you met John dealt with performance and, and, and issues of privacy and violation and whatever you want to say about the cut piece. And then, in a certain sense, the, the relationship you had with the public relationship you had with John con almost naturally continued some of these themes, e even like the bed in and things. This was yeah, yeah, well, I felt that it was good to, for us to do things like that, you know. Yeah. And um, I think John enjoyed it too, but um, and we both enjoyed it. Yeah, right. But I'm asking whether or not you consciously made some of the things that you did with him and after you met him a kind of artistic meditation on some of the themes you'd been pursuing. Now, it was, celebrity was one of those themes. Privacy. Look at the work like rape. I don't know. Well, okay. Yeah, well, but what, well, but what is the work like rape? Did you know that yeah. rape was made before I got together with John? No, I didn't know this. Yeah. Oh, mean, I'm sorry, on, we should explain what rape is. Yeah, but then you made it, actually. It was, rape is a film you made. Oh, may you explain rape it? Rape is a film we made, we made, um, when we were in the hospital. <laughs> you know, cause I, and, and uh, I just sort of uh, instructed this cameraman to go Get it, go do it, you know. Which was what? You I mean, probably hear people don't know the work. So. Well, rape is a film where um, you just keep on following a person and see how, how far you can go. The camera person is just following this other person, a stranger. Stranger. Right. And then follow, seeing what and the reaction is. And this woman, yeah. first, is very, very happy with this attention she's getting. Well, she's a very beautiful woman, too. And, uh, but then he starts to say, well, what are you doing? I mean, we don't want this, you know, and I don't want this. And, and the cameraman is silent. The cameraman doesn't say anything and just keep on following. And it's a very, suddenly becomes a very violent film, in, not in a physical sense, but uh, in a mental sense. Right. And this was something you conceived before you met John. I conceived it before. Yeah. The reason is because, uh, because of my family or something like that. I mean, there was always that sort of uh, idea that uh, people are always interested in what I do or what my family does, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. As, yeah. It was, from the beginning, it was like that. And I had to be very careful. My, my mother was always saying, 
you have to be very careful. You're going to hurt your family name <laughs> if you yeah. don't do something. You know, it was very, um, not very pleasant. Yeah. Um, so, th so this is true in a certain sense that the connection between your family and then your later life was related was, was a theme that what ran through your work consciously or not. It's like I'm put in a position always repeating that mm. form, whether I don't know if I had anything to do with it yeah. or not. But uh, I thought that the uh, the situation I had with Joan and the Beatles were very much like what I had with my family. In what sense? That you had to be extremely careful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and that you were, they were surrounded by people who were willing to jump on you or be critical. Oh yes, of definitely. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So your relationship with John became, of course, this um, this very public thing, and you said to me something very interesting yesterday as well about, um, especially when he became a house husband, that. People saw this as a, the women saw this as a, as a kind of an example, something that was, John was doing something that set, set an example, and that other people looked at your relationship as a potential model uh, or something. The ideal, ideal relationship yeah. or something. Yeah. Well, I really liked this idea of not really giving that feeling to people because it really is wrong. Uh, we were just men and women, and we had our fights, and we had uh, uh, all sorts of things that men and women would have uh, in terms of problems. But also, the other side of it mm -hmm. is that John had an incredible, incredible free life <laughs> until yeah. then. And I, I would say that I had a pretty free life too. Huh. So until when? When you say until then, until when? Until we got married. Until you got married. And so I was feeling, well, I have to really behave myself. <laughs> and Joe felt that way too. Yeah. So both of us were sort of being very nice to each other. Huh. And as Joan put it, that you know, you have to water every day. Huh. Yeah. You know. And he was like that. And I, I really yeah. appreciated that. You, you know? said that even when you had troubles and things, that, that you were very polite to each other. I know. No, 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 I wasn't there. I was, oh, okay. I was, this was a question. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, well, I think that there were many silences that we understood each other mm. by, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, you, and you, had, you had to struggle, I suppose, for the sense of quiet and privacy that well, you got. Well, in a very strange way, um, for somebody who really uh, yearned for freedom, mm. freedom of speech, freedom of act, freedom. I got into an incredible, incredible, unfree situation. Yeah, yeah, the most. But that was very much like my that's the start of my life. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's very interesting. But you made art out of this. I mean, this was this is what an artist does, right? So you continue to sort of see that the themes of your work should relate to these issues of freedom and, and, um, and you oh, yes, became definitely. very political I in mean, that sense. On a conceptual sense, yeah. I had freedom. Yeah. And that's what I created. Um, I know, I distinctly remember that when we were uh, at the farm mm -hmm. and we didn't have very much to you, eat. When you were a child. A yeah. child. And my brother, my younger brother, was looking extremely sad, you know. And I felt so bad about it. I said, why don't we make a menu, a, a kind of menu that would really make it feel good? Yeah. So I said, okay, okay. Uh, well, how about starting with ice cream? I said, ice <laughs> cream, oh, that's great. And we started to create a menu. Yeah. And that was very effective. Yeah. And that's the kind of thing I was doing. In other words, art for me was a way of life, hmm. a way of survival. Hmm. The menu was like some of your works of art, in other words, Definitely, the thing you could, yeah. and you could because think of in your head. I didn't have anything. Yeah. So the thing is, everything is in my head. Yeah, yeah. Some people, many, many people, not some people, still have a lot of trouble with conceptual art to begin with. They think the whole idea 
of a work of art that is not a physical object, something that you make, especially something that, you, that takes skill to make, a, a certain notion of skill, that it can't really be a work of art. So well, what, what do you tell people who say the, that? The notion of art was very different for me, for me. Mm -hmm. because when I hear somebody play the violin or something, no matter how great the violin is, there's a certain limit that doesn't exist in a conceptual world. And I love the conceptual world. It's almost like somebody who hmm. prefers being a dreamer. Huh. So in other words, conceptualism allows a broader range of possibilities. Broader, much broader. I've answered the question. I'll just give you one little answer and see what, just as a, by way of putting it in a question. I've said to people that, to me, even when you go to a museum and you experience a work of art, let's say you look at a work by Chardin and you love it and it moves you very much, you leave the museum and it exists in your head as a memory. Yes. And the quality of the work of art, in a sense, can be measured by the number of people and the power of the memory uh, that they have of this work of art. And so, in other words, that works of art are always, on some level, existing as a, as a concept, as a thing that you well, keep in your yeah. head. But, um, but still, people, I think, are troubled that there, is, that there could be something that isn't a physical uh, thing that you could hold in your hands. Well, that's because there's a certain a strong convention about it, you mm. know, that we feel that unless it exists, uh, unless you can, well, you can't even touch it. Uh, that's a very interesting thing. Yeah. You go to a museum, you see something, and you feel that, well, okay, it's there, and it's something that you can touch. No, you can't. Yeah. I mean, you invited people to do all sorts of things to the art, yeah, yeah. to burn it, uh, step <laughs> on it. Uh, draw on it and so forth. You, you wanted there to be some creative interaction. Well, because I was, uh, I was crazed with loneliness. Yeah. The, uh, the, um, w we were talking a little bit uh, earlier about the memorial uh, in Germany that I described in which someone put a, created a monument in reverse. People could I draw love that on the idea. Monument. I love that idea. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just tell you very briefly, in Germany there was one mo uh, memorial in which everyone was allowed to draw on the four sides of a kind of a pillar that as people drew on it, the pillar would be pushed down farther into the ground. So you'd draw on the bottom part, it would get filled up, they'd push it down until finally the monument was a hole in the ground, essentially just the square you'd see on top. And what was interesting about what people drew was they drew all sorts of things. They drew like peace what? signs and and they drew swastikas. It was, but whatever it was, was because a Because it's going to be buried. But yeah. the, it was just, it was an open field. As you said about dreaming and, uh, and, and in your mind, it's, it can be, you can't control it. But the work of art itself embraces all of these possibilities. It's beautiful. I really think that um, art, art and music, but art with capital A, um, is something that could really benefit the world and change the world. Without knowing it even. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and you these go. days, this is really amazing that um, it didn't happen in the 60s or even the 50s, but because the society is getting to a place that's rather intense, and art is supposed to reflect what is in the society in a way, what is we don't just do that. I mean, there's a prophetic uh, element as well in art. But therefore, I see so many activists, so many activists around me uh, who are artists, you know, because they feel that they have the power of communication. And uh, right now, I mean, um, there are many things that I'm always dealing with. Yes, yeah, so we were going to talk about activism, which we should do maybe yeah, now. Yeah. Activism is so important at yeah. this point. Well, let me ask you, what, it, what is the role of an artist uh, in, in terms of affecting social and political change? Because clearly now you believe especially strongly that this is the role of an artist. But how? What is an artist capable well, of doing? See, I don't want to say artist because I think that all of us are artists in many ways, you know, without knowing. And you have to just get into yourself and you find that there's an incredible superpower there. And you want to bring that out. And the way you bring it out is by not being, uh, not being uh, affected by, the, affected by the, the situation that you can't bring it out. You just bring it out. And so 
All of us are bringing out all these superpowers, and together, we can change the world. So, okay, but I'm going to sound like but it's the, very logical, you know. I yeah. mean, I'm not saying anything that is <laughs> not no. logical. But no, but okay, but I'll I'll be I'll be the cynical. Uh, oh yes, uh, uh, the uh, critics, the okay. cynical critic. Yeah, no, I mean, um, so, but uh, first of all, do you think that there is an obligation? for an artist to engage in social well, yes, okay. political things? Let's talk about obligation. Yeah. It's an obligation to yourself mm. and to the people you love. Yeah. And I think that just recently I realized that beauty is what you love. What you love is beautiful. Mm. And all of us have that, that very beautiful, beautiful experience of having beauty in our lives. And so that all together, we can make a beautiful world. And we're about to do it now. I think that there's many situations that we already have. Yeah. That is the future situation. Yeah. So you've done various projects. And one of them is the, the, in Iceland. Describe it. I know. And maybe we have an image of it somewhere, I hope. Do we have it? OK. Yeah. So what happened was, when I met John in 1966, and uh, I think in 67, he invited me to his um, Kenwood uh, home. And uh, I, I, I just went because I thought it was a party or something. But <laughs> actually, it wasn't. But anyway, he <laughs> said he wanted, to, he wanted me to uh, put this lighthouse in his garden. And I said, well, this is just a conceptual idea, and I don't know how to make it. <laughs> and I was laughing. A lighthouse. Yeah. There was a light. Lighthouse, which is only made out of light. So then I said, oh, it's a pity you don't know. So anyway, we forgot about that because I couldn't do it. And uh, move on, you know, next, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> and then just recently, about 10 years ago, it was mm -hmm. it, that I thought, I don't mind making that uh, light, light tower if I can do it. And for some reason, the minute I thought about it, all things started to happen, huh. you know, like, oh, well, you can do it nice. Yeah. Know. And I made this um, Imagine Peace Tower uh, to dedicate it to John, because John is the first one amongst all my instruction pieces yeah. and uh, my work. He picked that one. And he said, make it in my garden. Well, so Iceland is now his garden. It's very sweet. And, what, and can you explain the work? What, what is it exactly, and where is it in Iceland? What is it? Oh, OK. So in Iceland, there's an a island called Vide. Mm -hmm. And um, I put it there. Uh, first they said, well, you know, you can put it in uh, uh, Reykjavik mm -hmm. or Vide. And Vide seems like a little bit further. It wasn't that far. You know, it's like 10, 15 minutes ride. Mm. But I thought, well, it's better than Vide. And now it's really shining there. It's beautiful. Yeah. Mm. And this is the light coming up at night, yeah? Ah, yeah, yes. Yeah. Well, I think you see. Yeah, yeah. it's very nice. Uh, and people, and this is very strange, because I thought it's going to be uh, a light tower that's probably you know, sort of high, tall. And all the journalists were saying, how tall do you think it's going to be? No. So I said, well, you know, I live on seventh floor. I hope it's going to be tall as the seventh floor. <laughs> <laughs> what am I saying? If it doesn't come to seventh floor, what am I going to do? You know? <laughs> and then when it actually happened, I mean, I'm so glad I'm still alive because there's so many things I'm learning. Mm. Because it went like this. And it bent as if there was a curve in the sky. I couldn't believe it. But it was so beautiful. And why did it do that? I don't know. Really? I mean, you know, I'm not a particularly good <laughs> chem <But> chemist. <laughs> <laughs> but that's incredible. I know. Yeah. But it made it past seven floors. Well, actually, yeah. this is becoming something that people like. Yeah. And in, um, oh, so I like this every year from John's birthday. Mm -hmm to December 8th when he died. Mm. So it looks like, you know, 
from October to December. You know, it's right. a short life, but you know, it's, it's very okay. symbolic. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, <clears throat> when I light it, I think October 9th, from October 8th maybe, I would like to show you the map, which I didn't, <laughs> map of the world. Mm. There's so many places in the world that are all looking at this uh, Imagine Peace Tower yeah. and th th that day. And it's not just United States, which is very, very congested. I mean, many people do. England, uh, France, Germany, but these big countries. But, you know, like Angola. Yeah. Right. <laughs> they're, they're looking at Imagine Peace Tower huh. from Angola. You've had, I mean, I. I I guess I am saying this to flatter you, but I mean, it's also true. Don't flatter me. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> but I mean, a lot of your work, like you were saying that uh, I, there, there are these um, wish trees everywhere, and people just make this up on their own. They're just, it almost seems like some of your work is the kind of thing that is just out there that can be just uh, adopted. There's well, also like, a, you know, I'm just uh, planting seeds. Planting seeds. Like that. So mm -hmm. tell me you were in the Hayward Gallery the other day. What did oh, you see? Oh, I know. <laughs> it was a really incredible experience. Uh, maybe you saw it in this thing, that there's a canvas, but nothing on it, you know. And my thing was a canvas without anything on it, and there's a little instructions that this is supposed to be this or whatever. And I went to Hayward Gallery, and it's about 20 or 30 artists. They're all doing that. This <laughs> Just a blank canvas. Blank canvas and a little instruction there. <laughs> so I thought, oh my God, this is amazing. The, the, uh, well, I wouldn't say that the, the world, but uh, I would say that somehow yeah. now yeah. it's starting to be very strong about wanting to uh, see a conceptual work yeah. or want to make conceptual work. I, I suppose that is true. You yourself have, uh, if I may say, you have a wonderful collection of art that you have put together. <laughs> no, I don't want to know about that. But, anyway. but no, but I mean, you have certain favorite artists who are, who are meaningful to you. Yes, because you know, it, it's, it's the same thing, isn't it? The Magritte. Yeah. I love Magritte. Magritte. Yeah. And why? Why do you love Magritte? Uh, well, uh, he's a dreamer, huh. and his um, conceptual work is very romantic in a way. Huh. In what sense is it romantic? Well, it deals with people's emotion. Mm. I mean, do you find, so, I mean, do you find surrealism somehow relates to your own work? Oh, definitely. Yeah. I mean, I feel that I live in a surreal world. Huh. Uh, just about <laughs> sort of at the edge of going to the mental hospital. Well, I would never. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a good place to be? No, I don't think so. <laughs> no, but I mean... I shouldn't have said that. I well, <laughs> yeah, it's fine. It's good. Um, but so Magritte, okay, so it's partly about the fact that he, he lives in this dream world, which is true, or he imagines a dream world, which is part of what you would yeah. like to do too. But he also, do you find his pictures beautiful? I'm, I'm surprised that he's such a technically uh, yeah. very proficient yeah. Artist. Yeah, he comes up with images that are stick in your mind, but are also beautifully made. I, uh, it's fantastic. Yeah. yeah, it's true. What other artists do you like? Myself. <laughs> yes, yeah, yourself. Oh, I see. No, I see. I'm just that. joking. <laughs> yes, besides yourself. <laughs> well, I like Leger. I mean, because yeah. you see, I like Leger, artists. Yeah. I like artists who have something to say. Yeah. Not wallpaper. You yeah. Know. What do you mean by wallpaper? So who's wallpaper? Just pretty. Yeah, but who Decorative. do you really mean? Yeah, but well, who? I'm not going to mention any of yeah, <laughs> I, I think I know who you mean, but well, <laughs> so what, in other words, paintings that are, you, you like pictures and works of art that actually have some. Well, it doesn't have to be a picture, but yeah. it creates an emotion in you yeah. that has some meaning. Yeah. So let me just <coughs> ask, what about an artist like de Kooning or uh, the well, abstract painters. No comment. No comment. <laughs> okay, I'm going to a I'm going to ask you a question. I think may surprise the audience. What about some of the pop artists? A oh, pop artists. Well, I think that uh, they've been um, promoted almost uh, too well, maybe. Yeah. Because I went to Venice. Overrated. 
Overrated, okay. Yeah. Wallpaper? I went to, they like wallpaper? No. <laughs> no. Okay. I went to Venice, mm -hmm. and there was a show of 50 years of uh, European art. Mm -hmm. And it was so beautiful. Yeah. It had some meaning, each one of them. Yeah. And then they had Andy Warhol and all that sort of like throw in, I suppose. Yeah. But there was no competition. Mm. I mean, the other stuff, not as opposed to Warhol, was much more interesting. Exactly. Yeah. I think well, that may... I, I happened to like Andy. <laughs> right. <laughs> and we were good friends, but I mean, still, yeah. I think that in terms of art, um, yeah. well, it's, it's good to see art that is real art. Yeah. Well, okay, but I, I, I was struck by this. I know how you feel this way. So, I mean, let me just push this a little bit farther. Oh, okay. Just a tiny <laughs> bit. And say, I mean, um, one of the things that's strike some people as problematic with my work no with no. Andy Warhol's work yes is that there's a certain uh, um, coldness to it certain chill yes and and I mean is this maybe part of an issue for you with his work that it seems too cold I can't say that because uh, I do get uh, criticism or reviews where they feel that I was not emotional enough and huh. uh, you know sort of like just logical stuff yeah but you listen to reviewers I you do should have never that. listen to reviewers no 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 but I do have that too uh -huh. you know I have you know two sides of the coin yeah. yeah that sometimes you feel as well you're not as no, no as forthcoming as you should be in your work no I wouldn't say it should be but I like to experiment yeah. in that particular way of dealing with things being too. more remote or yeah. yeah and what about in your music your own music do you, would you say that that's... I would say that my music is more emotional. <laughs> yeah. And more intuitive, or is it the same? Or was it... In what way does it differ from... What does music give you that making objects or writing or whatever does not? I think the vibration is very different. Huh. And I think that uh, art has an incredible vibration too, but it's very kind of like slow and uh, quiet, you know, huh. compared to music. I think the music vibration goes right up to the universe. And maybe the art vibration will go slowly. <laughs> yeah. You, you, it, you, your reaction to it, in other words, is different. With music, it's very direct. You see, even if when you're asleep, the sound will just permeate you. Mm. Whereas um, artwork, you know, it's better to look at it. Yeah. Or maybe imagine it. <laughs> yeah, I often find also that music I mean, it's the simplest obvious thing to say, but music has inevitably a kind of intensity and poignance because it's passing, it's, end, it's, it's in the process of ending, you realize it's, it's temporal. That's what I think about performance art, you know, oh. or even installations. Mm -hmm. I make these very complex installations. Yeah. And it, you know, it'll be standing for a month or something, and that's... And then it's gone. Yeah. yeah. So we've been talking a lot about the way in works, works of art need to be open and they can be a dream and things change maybe people participate or they don't whatever but um, th you know there's some discussion in both your own work when you release uh, recordings of, of your own and then when you have been um, releasing uh, re-releasing some music of John's yes. um, <laughs> about uh, so that you've cr created some you know little tempests over remixing and things, uh, like with Imagine. So first of all, tell me, what was the thinking of behind remixing? Okay. But, you know, sometimes you have to remix. Uh, the controversy, just to be clear, if I, so everyone yeah, understands, yeah, yeah, is, yeah. is that people feel you're tampering with the original, but First yeah? of all, I'm so used to people saying something that is not particularly nice about me, you know, so I'm used to that. <laughs> so you can't really... Uh, work on the basis of that, because then you won't work. So I know that some people are not going to like it. But uh, with John's work, um, uh, the, the stuff that we did it like in 1972, around that time, now, because of uh, the advance of um, uh, equipment and instruments and all that as well, but people are used to listening to music that is not very quiet. Uh, this is almost like uh, compared to um, the kind of piano they used to play 
uh, in the age of Chopin, for instance. If you listen to Chopin now, you know that it's kind of like adjusted to our years. But if you were there at the time of Chopin and listened to it, it's just going, you know, it's just going to be very quiet. So uh, the stuff that we did in 72, around that time, um, was getting so quiet that nobody would want to listen to it that way. So I had to adjust it to the uh, contemporary ears. Mm. And that's, that's all I did. Yeah. I didn't change anything. I yeah. just wanted to boost it up. But I mean, um, I guess the, the larger question I would have, and then we'll move on from this, but the question is, so is there such a thing with a work, with your, in your conception of art or music, of what you might call the, the, the true original, the thing, the urtext, you'd say in German. The, so, you know, the thing, and then, because in, in, with May your I own answer work, that one? Yeah. I know what you say. <laughs> I know what you're going to say. Yeah, sure. Well, the point is, you know, I wanted to explore something new, a new field, which I did. Mm. But it doesn't mean that, you know, uh, it's just a, an alternative, it's an option. And uh, I would like to see that uh, the, the society will keep on uh, involving all different kinds of possibilities. And what I did was just to show some possibilities. But um, meanwhile, I, I love to listen to uh, Schoenberg or <laughs> Chopin, or, and you know the the fact that it's good to have that sort of form of music as well. You don't want the music to be just totally the same. It's not a communism. <laughs> you know, you want all different kinds of experience, and so um, you know. Okay, but if I'm understanding you, I, that what what I think you've just said. Is that the, so? Therefore, you want the music to exist in different forms. I'm not going to say, listen, this is what I discovered. So, it has to be all that. I mean, that's you know, totally, totally. Right, but yeah. with the, but when you are dealing with releasing John's music, or even when you're dealing with Apple things related to the Beatles, you 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 try to be very precise and careful in what you're yes, doing. Yes, very much. Yeah. So, as if there is a true form that you want to release. Yes. Well, you know, if I did anything that is going against what John did, I mean, there's 20 engineers, you know, around me, and they can strangle me <laughs> 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 because they're all John Lennon fans. Yeah. I would never do something like that. I mean, like, you know, I'm not wearing my pajamas, though my pajama might be very beautiful. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you're wearing this beautiful, uh, yeah, yeah. well, the, Suit. The, the jacket that you use for concerts, you know, yeah, when the concert pianist. Yeah. So, you know, we do all that. Yeah. We don't have to always wear concert pianist right. jacket. Right. Right. No, I mean, listen, I'm not saying this, of course, to be critical, but I, I guess I'm also raising the issue because it does relate to the work that you've done, this sort of open-endedness, this desire that things could be, it take on different forms, different oh, lives. And if I may say so, that um, being with John, mm. I never made him do the stuff that I thought would be interesting, in that sense. The stuff that would be what? Well, interesting in that sense. In, in other words, I didn't say, OK, this is what we do in avant-garde. Why don't you do it? I never uh, did that. Yeah. So when he did, for instance, the piece we saw at the beginning, yes. it was something he wanted to You. He, this yeah, was, he wanted to join. Yeah. yeah, it was playful. Let's go back to an early work and end with this. OK. Which is, can you, if you could play, um, the rap piece. And after that, and we have a QA. <laughs> we do, but, but we're going to do some, but we'll try something before that, yeah? We'll oh. play rap piece so people see what it is, and then maybe they can rap you. Okay. What do you think? Okay. Okay. And um, I will be sitting on the center of the stage, and anybody who would like to come up on the stage, please come up and rap me with a girl's bandage here until I disappear.
Let me the skies. Let me the clouds. Will I miss the ocean? Will I miss the bay? Will I miss the sunrise? Will I miss the moon? Will I miss the mountains? Will I miss the trees? Will I miss the city lights? Will I miss the snow? Will I miss the laughter? Will I miss the jokes? Will I miss touch? Will I miss love? Will I miss you? Will I? Time for Q and A. So I, as the line looks fabulous, but but, but, we'll, but we'll can you stand two more minutes of rapping? I'll tell you when. Don't worry. I'll make sure you're mobile and your mouth is not covered. You won't get wrapped like this. So we'll do this one more minute, and then I'll open this up to questions. And those of you on the back of the line who are clearly not going to get to rap can ask questions, because that's where the microphones will be. You can say anything you want. The fact that some people actually take cue and did it would be their memory, and I think you did. Yeah. But also the fact that you were done Yes. So I don't know if you all heard that, but she said it's wonderful that everyone came up, and, and it's astonishing, but it's also wonderful that you watched and shared this experience. Yeah, I'm so, so glad. Thank you. <laughs> so we're going to have a couple of microphones and figure out what to do here in a moment. But, um, and then we'll open this up. We'll have about 10, 10, 15 minutes of questions. That's OK. <laughs> you know, the other thing I want to say is the fact that we artists, and all of your artists too, we artists 
have a time machine. Because you see, we went from uh, three time when we were doing things with John and, uh, Jonas as an as assistant. And then we suddenly went to Liverpool, which is a different time zone. And uh, so that's very interesting, yeah. I think, that we can go to any time, you know, as being an artist. And that's what we did today, that we, we had a time machine and we went through all different times. And just remember that feeling that, you know, instead of just thinking about one part of the past or something like that, you go you know, to the future, now, and the past. <laughs> okay, thank you. It's also. Okay, so let me begin here, first question. Thank you so much for coming to speak with us today. Thank you. I love the dance remixes of your work. Oh, <laughs> great. <laughs> I bought all of them on iTunes that, that, that exist. I think there are 28 different albums, but um, can you talk a little bit about how that came about, how you came to be ahead of the, the, di the disco well, scene now? It's very interesting because dance uh, chart is not well known so much. I mean, you know, like the, the rock or the pop was. And I went into it, and I realized that it's a very different world. And the people who are remixers are like gods. <laughs> and they're doing an incredible job, but also very, very different from the usual uh, rock and pop and that, and, and whatever, country or whatever. And I really think it's an incredibly beautiful um, uh, what I say, world in which we can dance. Thank you. Sure. Yes. Hello, Yoko. Yes. It's a pleasure being here. And it was a pleasure uh, seeing you in a similar circumstance uh, 10 years ago down what, what? at the New School. And at that time, uh, you had a similar interview. Could you just put your mouth a little bit closer? Oh, I'm sorry. Thank okay. It's a pleasure seeing you uh, about 10 years ago down at the New School. Uh, with one of the first times talks uh, in uh, January of 02. And at that time, you had one of your assistants. I don't know if you can see from there. Do you know what these are? Ah, yes, of course. And <laughs> uh, you said that in 10 years, we will meet again, for those of you who don't see. These are pieces of a puzzle of the sky. And Yoko at that time said, in 10 years, we will meet again to assemble the sky. Well, in November, I wrote you a letter, but in fact, I don't know if I had the right address or anything. I never heard from you. And I was wondering, <laughs> did that event ever take place? And if not, will it take place? Well, you see, it's a very complex situation there. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, it shows that in 10 years, we are not going to be the same. Mm -hmm. And that is really something that clearly uh, tells you with this particular piece. It's a very interesting piece in that sense. We want to meet in 10 years, but we will not be there. Mm. So in other words, I was taking it too literally when, <laughs> in, <laughs> when in fact it was a, a conceptual thing. Because you're different too. You're yes. a different person now. No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yes, sir. Uh, Yoko, I'm curious, um, when you and John released uh, Give Peace a Chance as a single in 1969, I remember buying the single, and I remember turning it over and listening to your beautiful ballad, Remember Love, which was on the flip oh, side. Oh, you like that? Thank you, and thank you. One of the most beautiful melodies I've, I've ever heard, actually. And my question is, the conscious decision to make that the B-side of a very important song that was a change the world type song, like Give Peace a Chance was, I was just wondering the thought processes that went into making that the B-side as kind of an idealized version of the world and then the reality <laughs> of the world and give peace a well, chance. Well, it just happened, you know. But I, when I think about things that just happened, I always think it's a blessing and also that it was meant to be. Somebody was helping to have Remember Love on the B-side. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. 
First, I want to take a shout out to Mike McHugh, who just spoke, one of the anti-folk people, great songwriter, musician, and has booked my band to play many times. Mm -hmm. Hi, Mike. How are you? <laughs> Fine. How are you? Ms. Oko, um, I know this is going to sound really strange, and don't let the business suit fool you. This is just how I make a living. I'm actually a spiritual medium, and uh, John Lennon has communicated with me several times, and he tells me that he communicates with you. And I was just curious how he does that, whether he comes to you in dreams or when you're conscious or you just sometimes hear his voice. Or what? <laughs> or what? I mean, there are many different ways of being a spiritual medium, as I know, but he, he has indicated to me that he is in touch with you regularly. So. Well, you know, I didn't think that I'm going to be like this today. <laughs> you know, and it's always something that happens without my knowledge, which is so important, I think, you know. And I really feel that um, that's how my life is. Mm -hmm. And I feel alive because it's, I'm given so many different kind of options and uh, experience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. Yoko, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> uh, my name is Jack Lardis. Um, <clears throat> I, I'm a founder of an art movement called Oil Drum Art, which is an environmental and geopolitical art movement. And because of the, your beliefs about art can be more than aesthetic, it can be, it can have meaning, it can have a message, it can make people think. I would like to ask for 20 minutes of your time to share this idea with you and have your evaluation of it. Uh, uh, what is, I'm sorry, what are you asking? You're asking for her time, but what was the movement that you It's called Oil Drum Art. It's all about oil and the impact it has had on society and the planet. And so he's saying that he's involved with uh, oil drum art, which is, in, 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 con which is artists concerned about the effect of oil on, on, on the planet. You, you and I have talked about fracking as well. Yes, could yes, I talk that about that? <laughs> I'm really involved in this thing now, which is anti-fracking. And the way they're fracking is really dangerous for us, for our health and for the, the land. I mean, the land when you say land, you know, some people say, well, I don't own a land. Well, we own the planet, and we don't want to destroy the planet. But it's a very interesting thing that, you know, these people want to make money, and they say, well, we found a great way of making money by killing people, <laughs> you know? And it doesn't, that is not gonna work. And so um, I stood up for it, my son stood up for it, and then, uh, I asked all my friends to um, join me, and very luckily, a very important um, artist all joined me. Who did? Who has joined you? Paul McCartney, Ringo Starr, uh, <laughs> and... Uh, uh, Robert De Niro. What? Lady Gaga. Yeah. <laughs> Robert De Niro. Yeah. I mean, all these people immediately just wrote to me and said, okay, put my name in there. And I was surprised, I couldn't believe it. But it's really, it's getting like that because fracking is so dangerous Oops. to us and to our children and to our grandchildren. I mean, this is the way to kill Earth. And by killing Earth, what is it to make money? I mean, that person is going to be killed too. So what are we talking about, you know? And so really try to keep well, right now, because uh, the governor of New York State is just two minds about it. Shall we do it or shall we not do it? So if you write to Governor Cuomo a letter saying, please don't frack us, you know. <laughs> well, well. And please do. Okay. Just postcard will do, you know. Just send it to him. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I'm, I'm and doing, he I'm doing the feel, uh, Facebook. Okay, there are many people who want me to be the president of the uh, country the next round or something, and I should make sure that, you know, I, I don't anger too many people. You know, I like him to understand the logic of it. Yes, Cuomo. Yes, sir. Yes? Uh, yes, I would like to just ask a sort of 
boring art history question, Michael. Maybe you can help me flesh could, it out could a little you, bit. Could you? Uh, talk can you hear me? Okay. What, I'd what? like to get your impressions of uh, two artists, one of which I somewhat see parallels with you because of your nationality and age, which is Yayoi Kusama, and the other is your connection with performance art, which is Marina Abramovic. Did you hear that? No. He wanted to know your, he, he wanted to know your thoughts about Kusama. Oh, yeah, yeah. And Abramovich. And who? Marina Abramovich. Abramovich. Oh, my God. I think they're both incredibly, incredibly uh, strong artists. And uh, in a different way. Abramovich is, uh, you know, performance art, and Kusama is more to do with the, uh, the paintings and uh, objects and all that. But I mean, they're, they're sort of like, like some is, uh, you know, almost like a, a performance art arts, artist too, you know. And I have so much respect for both of them. You, uh, did, did you have a relationship with Kusama? Do you know Kusama? Oh, okay. So when, <laughs> Kusama, was, <laughs> when Kusama was here in New York, a long time ago, that is, you know, we knew each other. And the first thing that I noticed about her is that uh, there was a, a painting show of Kusama in the village. And I was just being a sort of nationalist Japanese, maybe, I don't know. I think, oh, it's so good that some Japanese artists are getting a show. So I went there, and I was very proud of it as a Japanese. And, so, and then we met later, and uh, we were good friends. Uh, Abramovich, I sort of admire his, her work, but we just had uh, no contact in a way. But th that doesn't mean that, you know, we don't, well, I love her. But she's never reached out to you to say thank you. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I, mean, I really think that she's a busy, she's a very busy woman. Yeah, just and, busy woman. <laughs> and uh, she's into her thing, you know, uh, yeah. and that's very good. I mean, as yeah. an artist, you should be like that. Yeah, fair enough. Yes? Hello, uh, Yoko. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Uh, I'm a dancer and a choreographer, and I just want to say that you have been very inspirational to me in my creative life as an artist. And I, I love all of the peaceful messages that you often bring out to the world every year at New Year's time. And I want to thank you for being who you are. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think dance is such an incredible thing. It's, it's healthy. And even now, when I listen to music, if the music starts to uh, happen, then my body starts to move. <laughs> There's nothing I can do about it. Yeah. And I could keep on dancing until 3 in the morning. I mean, it's just <laughs> so good. And please understand that when you march, you're very serious, and you're angry as well, in some ways. And People can shoot you if you're marching. But somebody who's dancing, <laughs> would you shoot a person who's dancing? <laughs> so go with dancing. If, you know, if you're going to have a life, just dance, <laughs> not march. <laughs> OK? Yes, sir. Yes? Good evening, Yoko. Thank you so much for sharing your joyous life with us. Um, just briefly, a personal question. How do you distinguish between legitimate criticism and just envy of insecure personalities? Well, what was that? that, that uh, uh, how do you tell between legitimate criticism yeah, yeah. and, no, and just no way. envy? Look, I take all criticism uh, with grace. And I, I feel that it's really great that people are telling me these things about me. Why should they tell me? tell about me, you know, they could be busy telling me about, uh, well, Abramovich. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, they want to, you know, mention about my work, I'm very, very thankful. As long as they spell the name right. <laughs> I, I Thank you very much. Thank you. So we have time for one quick question before we're done. Okay, right, I'll, one tr quick. I'll try to be quick. Um, I'm one of those people of photographic memory. I see a guy with a tiger's cap. Just follow me. This is the exact calendar, 1984. Yesterday's the anniversary of the Tigers' last world title. Then they went out yesterday and won. Thinking about that, about tragically, baseball. 1941 and 1980, the same calendar. So Pearl Harbor Day was a Sunday both years. 
Now in 1980, mm -hmm. yeah, and then in 1980, the day after Pearl Harbor Day, we know what happened, and of course we know what happened to Japan, instituted by us or started by us after the war. What can you say to us now, all these years later? We still haven't given peace a chance. Well, you know what I think? Well, first of all, I have to say quickly yes. that I had nothing to do with Pearl Harbor. <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just say one thing? I hope that that's not what I implied, and I'm more upset. I'm not that far off the reservation. I'm upset a bit about Pearl Harbor, but reservation being the operative word. The United States did three heinous things. They brought people here in chains from Africa, they destroyed the Ameri Native Americans who were here, and they bombed uh, Japan after World War II, or the end of World War II. So go ahead, I'm sorry. Thank you. I think, no, he, I, I just think what, it's okay. <laughs> I, what, what he said, he just was saying that he was upset about the bombing of Japan and, and the, 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 what we did to Native Americans. Yeah. But what about peace? What can you say about peace? But, but, but we're, I'm here. We're, we're, we're done, so I have to let you go finish and thank you. Yeah, no, 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 say something and then, and then we're, we're say, done. Say it. Well, I just have to say that it's very, very sweet of you to come here tonight. And, uh, I love each one of you for that. <laughs> um, I really think that, you know, so we're meeting now, and one of those, you know, a, um, a person said, um, so in 10 years, what are we gonna do? You know, and this is the moment. That's all we have, you know? And that's why it's so important that we're together, and everything that we thought of today, this moment, this evening is going to influence the whole world and know that. And when you think about that, it's very, very beautiful. Life is beautiful. Life and beautiful beauty is what you love. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> 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 that was one.